I mean, thank you. And thanks for having me. And good morning in the room and online. Um, church has always been messy, but it's always been fun. And it's always been dependent on a bunch of people making an effort to make things happen. So fair play particularly to your sound guys today. And thanks for having me. And, and also, um, well done with the worship and everything else. And is there any limit to young Daniel's talents, eh? <laughs> Playing the drums by a mile, the best footballer in the football team my son also plays for. And uh, it's just, just not fair, is it? Sometimes life is not fair. Um, Surely one parent was good at one thing, one at the other, happy days. Anyway, it's really wonderful to be with you. Happy New Year. It is the start of a new year and let's not miss this chance for some new hope. You know, next Monday is officially, not tomorrow, the Monday after, is officially the lowest point of the year. It's the day when everyone gets their credit card bills. It's the day where historic people are most, this year of all years, let's stand out like stars in the universe, showing what is different when you stand in a desperate time, but you stand on the rock of ages, when you stand with Jesus. I believe what we need from the church in this continuing season is a new move. We need a new move, we need to do things differently. We need to hold ourselves in a different way. But let's not pretend this season's thrown up so much challenge, hasn't it? It's been the ultimate bittersweet season, I would say. It's been horrendous how painful it's been. It's been awful how many people have died. It's been terrible, some of the restrictions. As a parent, I can't believe that my kids are going to be at home again to be homeschooled. Not for me, but for them. But the fact that my children would have missed out on the best part of a year of school. This is, this is challenging for the long term. It's been really bitter, hasn't it? But it's also been sweet. At times, we've had a greater sense of community. We've seen all kinds of things happen. I'm an evangelist through and through. For 20 years, I've preached about wanting to see the United Kingdom open to the gospel. I've never seen it as open as it's been in the last nine months. So it's bittersweet. And there's been some big changes, is not there? There's been a change in spiritual temperature, no doubt about it. This has been a really hard time for the saved, but a really amazing time spiritually for the lost. As the saved, we've struggled because we've been like, we can't go to church, we can't do this, we can't do that. It's all the things we can't do that we want to do. But for those that have never known Jesus, they're like, wow, there must be more than humanity because humanity is pretty pants. You know, it's been an interesting time. Do you know that one in four people in the country have been to online church? Isn't that amazing? But in the last six weeks, only half of those that normally go to church have been at all. We're living in this interesting time, aren't we? Only 5% of the population normally go to church. So half of that 5% are going, but of those that never go, a quarter of them are going. Isn't that interesting? There's also been a change in style. A year ago, the church would have said they couldn't do online church. My friend who uh, runs something called the Alpha Course, Nicky Gumble, said that to me recently, he said, we didn't believe online Alpha would work. We've now got 1,600 in the UK alone. You know, we didn't think we could do online church. You know, six weeks after, after the first lockdown started, that's the only time that Zoom has broken all year in the UK. It broke between half 10 and 12 on a Sunday morning. Who else was using it? Everyone else is asleep. You know, we broke Zoom thinking we couldn't do online church. We've done a change in style. Going forward as a church, don't just go back to how it was. I think going forward, church will be more of a buffet than a set menu. It used to be a set menu, didn't it? Every church in the country, half 10, half six. Absolutely nothing to do with Jesus. Everything to do with milking cows. You used to go to get the milk from the cow at nine in the morning at five in the afternoon. It took half an hour to get the milk, half an hour to get clean, half an hour to get to church. Nothing to do with Jesus. Doesn't mean you can't still meet at that time, but we can't expect a world that has accepted something of a digital revolution to go back to just meeting in a building at a certain time. Online church is not an option, it's a necessity going forward, as well as the in-person, which by the way, I can't wait to return to. And there's something almost a bit teasing about this morning, isn't it? You sort of stand in worship and hum or secretly sing, hoping that no one realizes that, that you feel like you're sinning, but Jesus is probably quite pleased. But there's also been a change in cultural narrative. I lead the Evangelical Alliance. That's a recent job for me. I've been head of mission there for five years, but took over leading in October 2019. What a first year to lead the Evangelical Alliance. But um, what I've noticed is when I took over the role, every day I was asked by someone my moral view on something. What's your view on abortion? Who can marry who? What can happen? Because you're wanting to be pigeonholed. They want to pigeonhole you as hateful. From the start of the first lockdown, I've hardly been asked at all by anyone 
be it a politician in the highest levels of this nation, a secular journalist or anyone on the street, no one is asking you what your moral view is on anything. They're saying, how can the church help rebuild the society socially and spiritually going forward? They're saying help. The cultural narratives change. So I guess what I'm saying is don't live on yesterday's rules. Yesterday's rules were no one's interested in Jesus. Yesterday's rules were we do everything behind closed doors. No one sees it. Yesterday's rules were um, the nation hates us. None of this is true anymore. But it will all become true again if we don't act in the season we're currently in. You know, I mentioned the Evangelical Alliance. It's a fascinating time. The Evangelical Alliance is made up of three and a half thousand churches, including this one, who are members, about 600 organizations and tens of thousands of individuals who say, let's stand together to make Jesus known in the UK. Let's have a clear unity and mission and effective voice into the corridors of power. You know, in the last year, we have never in our 175 year history had the opportunities in the corridors of power that we've had during the COVID pandemic. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying that's reality. When people are desperate and they don't know who can help them, they look to the church. It's the church that in previous situations where the nation's not recovered, they've, they've done job creation. They've provided education. They've even put on prisons at times. It's the church that helps stand in the gap and say, let's, re, let's reimagine what's possible. But it's the church that stands together that does that in the nation. That's why I think it's vital we do stand together going forward. And we mustn't compromise on what we stand for. Let's not be afraid of, of, of needing to, let's not baptize our culture and just agree with everything the world agrees with. We don't have to do that, but we do have to say, we are here to together make Jesus known. That's why I forgive a little plug, but for 10 seconds, if you're not a personal member of the EA, might you become one? Why? Because the more members that stand together, the louder the voice. And we have a chance to transform this nation, but we've got to do it together. And the Evangelical Alliance does not ask you to, to to conform to, it's not a denomination, it's simply you saying, let's stand with many others in making Jesus known. There's two million evangelicals in this country and we can make Jesus known in the corridors of power. It's only three pound a month as well. It's a cup of coffee, isn't it? It's nothing. So eauk.org forward slash join us. Sign up today as an individual or as a couple. Same price either way. Sign up as a couple. Don't tell your spouse, tell them later. And, um, <laughs> and if you do, I'll send you one of these, Unleashed. This is mine and Anne's, Anne's my wife, our latest book, um, we wrote it ahead of the pandemic. It was all about how does a scattered church living like the Acts Church today make a difference and an impact. One of the lines in this is, imagine a United Kingdom where your garden fence is your pulpit and your street is your parish. We've, well, we've got it now, haven't we? So, you know, be encouraged by this. I'd love to send it out. But that's enough on that. What I would say, though, is what's been so fascinating is I've gone from running a 175-year-old institution to a 175-year-old startup because we're living in a different day. Everything's moving quickly, everything's very agile. And what we realize in this season too is, the substance of who we are as Christians mustn't change, but the style is changing like the wind around us. Some of us hate change, oh well, get on with it. Some of us love change, have a blast. But either way, the substance of who we are in Jesus mustn't change, but the style probably should. So I think it's time for a new move. So turn in your Bibles if you've got one, you might want to turn your Bible on or open it up to 1 Samuel 14, and I'm just going to read a few verses from verse 6. We're going to look at the story of Jonathan and his armour bearer. It says in verse 6, Jonathan said to his young armour bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armour bearer said, Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armour bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armour bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armour bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armour bearer followed and killed behind them. You know, it's just, uh, I just love this story. Saul stays under a tree, but his son begins to move. And the Lord's calling us to rise and move into a new day. 
The world writes one story, the Lord writes another. And I just think at the very start of this new year, there's just four really quick things. And you know what? They actually are quick. Four really quick things that I think are important to us to know as a church, but also as individuals. And for you as South Oxford Baptists, you're in between church leaders. You know, we don't call it interregnum, do we, us Baptists? We don't believe in kings. But you're in between ministers. You have a vacancy. And in this season, what's so important is, is not that you wait for your new leader. Is that a new leader comes in at some point to a healthy church that's already moving. You know, Christians are movers, not settlers, aren't they? We mustn't settle. Don't wait for your new leader. Crack on after all. And yeah, I'm an ordained Baptist minister. Us Baptists believe in the priesthood of all believers. They even need the leader. The leader will come eventually, but we do need to be moving. And the first thing I think the Lord has for us is, is courage. Is courage. I love it when it says, I love it when it says in verse 8, very simply, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. Now, now hang on for a minute, right? What does it look like here? Lots of people talk about scripture and what it says, but I did 14 years working with young people. I, I led Youth for Christ before I came to Evangelical Alliance. And, and one of the things with young people is they're so visual. They say, what does it look like? And I love the fact that the Bible is the most visual book you could come across. Anyone that says the Bible's boring hasn't read it. You can call it lots of things, but it's not boring. It's very visual. So I often ask when I read scripture, what does it actually look like? You know, so when Moses sees the sea split, I wonder, what did that look like? You know, I wonder two things. Firstly, how soggy was it? You know, was it like my walks to the rice lip Lido where you lose half your calf into the ground? Or was it actually okay? Secondly, and we had a bit of whales earlier. What if there's a massive fish? Does that split in half too? I'd love to know. Although um, Lot's wife, you know, when Lot's wife turns around, I feel really sorry for her. But when she becomes a pillar of salt, what did that really look like? And why salt and not pepper? I wish I knew. Or when Elijah and Elisha come to Mount Carmel and, and Elijah goes up and there's, there's chariots and there's whirlwinds and, and there's all kinds of fire and Elijah goes up to heaven and all Elisha's left with is some secondhand coat. What does it look like when Elisha thinks I've got to walk back down the hill and there's 50 prophets waiting? Or when Jesus is resurrected from the dead. In the book of John, the very first thing Jesus does when he's resurrected from the dead is he starts folding up dirty washing. He's buried in two sheets. He resurrects from the dead, right? He's the saviour of the world. And he starts folding up the sheets. Mary and Joseph raised him really well. Then at some point he thinks, hang on, I'm the Messiah. I better crack on with what I'm doing. And he leaves and he goes on. And one sheet remains unfolded, by the way how visual the bible is it's amazing isn't it what about this story what does it look like okay there is Saul and his 600 men with garden forks that's what they've got they've got their b and q garden forks nothing else to fight with and against them are hundreds of thousands of heavily armed philistines with chariots of fire on the other side and in the end though it's not 600 people with garden forks that take on the philistines it's two. I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy courage. Jonathan knew his dad would try and stop him. The army would think him crazy. So he doesn't stop for any advice. He listens to the voice of God and he moves. And Jonathan's courageous faith stands out in such contrast to Saul's paralysis. And I just guess how many of us, maybe we just need to be a bit courageous in this season. You know, I'm loving being back in the building. I've done such a mix. I've never preached as many times as I did in 2020. I've never seen so few people. <laughs> but I remember when it, when it was all first kicking off in the first lockdown, um, I used to lead Spring Harvest, and, and I've only just stopped. But I was leading Spring Harvest. And uh, the only reason I've stopped is, frankly, <laughs> leading the EA, I need to be absolutely focused on what God's called me to in this nation for the next decade. But with leading Spring Harvest, and all this is happening, and we suddenly had to put Spring Harvest online. And it was going to be the first time I was, I was going to be preaching online. And I was doing the gospel night because I often do the gospel night because I love seeing people meet Jesus. Absolutely fantastic. And I'm in my shed, effectively. I've got a little shed I work in the back of my garden because London houses are too small to have anywhere to work. And I was in there and I was recording into my phone. And before I started, I was just praying and I was basically telling the Lord it was a really stupid idea to do a gospel appeal into a phone. And I just felt the Lord say to me, do it as if you would in the room. So 
I proper gave it some. I did this big gospel appeal into my phone, thinking, what on earth am I doing? Then the day after this went out, I got a message from a wife. She'd been sat on her sofa at home, watching this on her TV. Next to her was her husband. Her husband had not been a Christian at any point, never been a Christian, and for 20 years had mocked her faith. Her husband's reading the paper next to her while she's watching me give it some of the telly. At the end, when I do a prayer, I, I do a prayer, I offer people a chance to repeat the prayer after me to surrender their lives to Jesus. He starts praying it. She starts weeping. After she says, oh, I didn't realize you were listening. He says, I wasn't. She says, well, what happened? She said, well, he's, he just said about following Jesus. And I thought, sounds like a good idea. So I prayed the prayer. Do you know what, friends? What I love is if we're courageous enough to say, yes, Lord, I'll have a go. He can take that and use it amazingly. It wasn't a good bridge. It wasn't a great response. And, and the fellow wasn't supposed to be there. But he was in the lounge, less next to the wife, listening in. We mustn't miss the opportunities we have right now. We need to be courageous. Where's Joe, Jonathan's confidence? It's in the Lord. That's the key to this whole passage. He can win a battle no matter how difficult the odds. Some of what we face looks impossible, but we need courage to face fear, go for it, and take some risks. You know, we celebrate winners in this country, but we don't always realize the risks they take. I'm a massive football fan. I support the same football team as Jesus. AFC Wimbledon, right? People say, why does Jesus support Wimbledon? It's very easy. He loves the marginalized, those mistreated, and those who've been forced to live in exile. And when it comes to football, though, um, people celebrate certain people, but what they don't realize is what they've done to get good. So I was reading an article in the Times talking about the fact that in the last full season, the two footballers that lost the ball more than any others in the Premier League and lost possession were Kevin De Bruyne and Trent Alexander-Arnold. Forgive me if you're not a football fan, but these two lost the ball more than anyone else. The two that set up the most goal-scoring opportunities were also Kevin De Bruyne and Trent Alexander-Arnold. The player of the year for the Premier League was Kevin De Bruyne. The young player of the year for the Premier League was Trent Alexander-Arnold. Friends, there's a correlation here, isn't there? Very simply put, people that take no risks don't always see the outcome they dream of. But people that take risks sometimes get it wrong. But you know what? You take risks, you go out on a limb, you see great things happen. Friends, we need more courage in this season. But secondly, we need togetherness. In verse 7, it says this. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan's armor bearer goes with him into enemy territory. Everyone else thinks this is crazy, no chance. But he goes with him. He's with him in everything. He trusts him. He's totally committed. He's got his back. Whose back have you got? Who's got your back? Who's with you? I often listen to uh, an Australian preacher who runs a church in New York called John Tyson. And one of the things he said recently that's really challenged me is, do not just surround yourself with those who agree with you but surround yourself with those who are hungry for what you're hungry for. What are you hungry for? I am so hungry to see a move of God in the United Kingdom that will transform this island of ours inside out, upside down and back to front to see something remarkable and incredible that will come through a new wave of prayer and holiness and commitment to God. I'm desperate to see that. Therefore, I want to surround myself with people who want that too, not people who want to argue with me about the colors of the corridor wallpaper. Real relationships committed to one another, like family, is what's called for in this season. I have struggled so much with all the talk about households. It goes against everything I believe in as an evangelist. As an evangelist, I believe you constantly extend your table and your household to make room for those outside of the kingdom at this moment. And yet all the talk is make sure your household is safe. Now, don't get me wrong, within the rules and everything else that's important, but we as the church need to make sure our whole communities are safe. Our whole communities are taken care of and we need to go together. There should be no such thing as a lonely Christian. Shouldn't exist because we've got brothers and sisters. You know, even in the introduction, Gavin doesn't really know any of us personally. That's cool, but I'm spending eternity with you, so you might as well like me. We might as well try. You know, we can do something the world can't do. We need each other in the months ahead. We can do a unity the world can't do. 
I realized this, we did a men's curry night in the Bina Curry House. That's right near where I live in Northwood. So it's a nice little commute this morning, my first day back to work. But you know, we were having curry. It's 15 men at the curry night, aged from 16 to 80 odd. Of the 15 men, I think there were 13 different ethnicities. My friend Ali runs the curry house says, what the chaff are you lot? I said, what do you think we are? He said, well, I think you're the church because you're a vicar type. I said, okay, any other reason? He said, yes, no other group in Northwood can get together a community as diverse as this around the table together. Friends, we can do something the world can't do. There should be a togetherness to us. We need courage. We need togetherness. But thirdly, we need faith. Second half of verse six says this. Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. You know, now is the time for faith. Now is the time to take ground. Even if the enemy looks so big, we don't think we can win. The church is called to rise in faith and trust. How is your faith? You know, this has been such a hard time for so many, hasn't it? It's been so difficult. It's been so hard. I've, not had, I've never had as many conversations with Christians who are doubting their faith. And yet I've never had as many conversations with non-Christians who are interested. But if he can save Jonathan and his armor bearer in the face of this army, he can save you and I in the face of a coronavirus pandemic. And he's longing to save others through us in the new move. I love the story of opening the windows, by the way, to get the music. We should do that. We should also open our mouths. We should also open our hands. We should also open our hearts to those around us. The Lord can do so much with so little. I love this. So encouraging, isn't it? It's like the story of feeding the 5,000. Amazing that, isn't it? Really the 12 to 15,000. Someone got lazy and only counted the men. But back in that story, Jesus feeds a field of 12 to 15,000 people with a boy's packed lunch, which, by the way, the boy didn't even want. You know, anyone who's done any youth work knows young men eat anything. That lunch that boy had was so terrible, he looked at it and thought, I don't really want this. You can give it to Jesus. And then Jesus took that rejected lunch and fed a field. He can do so much with so little. He's capable of giving victory to the few as well as to the many. And I just believe in this season, God wants to raise our faith. He wants to raise our hope and our expectation for what's possible. We've got to be able to show people what is different when you face this, but you face it standing on the rock of ages. You know, I wish we weren't facing this. I, I'm missing so many things. Some of them are really, really spiritual. I'm missing corporate worship. Do you know what? I'm also really, really missing going to the football, which I did every other week. I'm, I'm missing community. I'm missing being around people. But you know what? The greatest promise God makes in the word of God is this. I am with you always. The book of Matthew starts with he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. It ends with Matthew 28. I will be with you always till the very end of the age. We have got to show what's different. I also think God wants to bring back faith for, for that prodigal you've given up on, for that relationship where you thought they'd never come to Jesus. We've got an opportunity. It's such an easy ask right now. For things like an online alpha, it's such an easy ask. Would you sit in your lounge, eating your food on your Zoom, and you can turn it off when you like? We have not had a greater opportunity for such a simple ask. And I think God wants to raise up faith for some of the prodigals. The nation is living with mortality salience. Now, mortality salience is normally reserved for a war zone. Mortality salience is when people realize their mortality and fragility as a human being, and they realize they might die. What that makes people do is ask all the questions they never normally ask. For years, I've been longing for people to be asking what they're asking now. Let's not miss it. I love the story of a friend of mine who was so challenged during uh, the first lockdown that he put 15 Bibles on his drive. And inside each Bible was a, a, a WhatsApp phone number to join the WhatsApp group, the online Bible study. But he put a note by these Bibles, only take one if you'll read it. They all went in a day. And every week since, the lowest numbers he's had at his online Bible study is 10. From these people that he's never met. Because he stepped out in faith and saw something happen. It's a time for courage. It's a time for togetherness. It's a time for faith. And finally, it's a time for action. Second half of verse 12 says this. Come up to us 
and will teach you a lesson. No, that's not what I want to read. Sorry, forgive me for that. It's it, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. That's it. Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Faith without deeds is dead. We can't just speak and watch. It's also time to act. We have an opportunity where the world is watching. Where is the Holy Spirit prompting you to take action? Where is the Holy Spirit nudging you? It's time for the whole church to be released. What new space is God calling you to? What, you know, and we can say, yeah, but we're, we're restricted. We've never had people as available as they are right now. It's just a different method. I cannot think of a better time to be locked down than now. Why? Because we've got every technology you could ever want. Probably in 10 years' time, it'd be even better, but let's not deal with that just now. But we've got every bit of tech you could ever want. Reach out to someone, make a difference, help people, bless people. I believe we're in a season of suddenlies. Suddenly this happens, suddenly this changes. You might have noticed you, you, you get used to something, and suddenly everything changes. Suddenly this thing up, suddenly there's a new variant, suddenly there's a vaccine, then another vaccine. But then suddenly I realize I'm a 41 year old, incredibly fit young man. There's no chance I'm getting it till Christmas. You know, it's suddenly this, suddenly that, suddenly. We're in this sort of time of suddenlies and into the suddenlies we need to act. God's giving us new ground quickly. And we need to move and be willing to move. We need to put down fear, distraction, people pleasing, our old ways and act. I think the church in this nation's kind of split two ways. One group who are loving all the change in terms of style and everything being thrown up in the air. The other group who are like, I just can't wait till we're back to normal. It's safe again. And it's all good. I'm not sure either group's right. <laughs> I think in the middle is something of the truth but we do need to act with what's in front of us and be open to what God's going to do. Just before the uh, November lockdown, I knew that I needed to get a haircut, right? My wife had cut my hair twice. That was twice too many. It looked terrible, but it, but it, she got it. To, so I was doing so much filming that I just said to her, don't worry about the back, just sort out the sides and, the, and just, and so the back, it wasn't quite a mullet, but it wasn't great. And I went in for this haircut. Now I've been going to the same barbers for five years. I have been trying to lead this barber to Jesus for five years. I kind of think if I have to pay his London price for a haircut, he has to listen to me talk about Jesus. For five years, zero interest, absolutely nothing. Kept trying, but nothing. I walked in and he says this to me. He says, I am so pleased to see you. I've never wanted to talk about God so much. And I sat there while he cut my hair talking about Jesus. I mean, I think he cut my hair extra slow as well. It was like, it's going forever. At the end, I gave him a link to join an online alpha course. He's not giving his life to Jesus yet, but something's happened. Something's moving. And we've got to be willing. In my mind, Grant was closed. Oh, whoops. In my mind, my barber was closed. But in reality, completely open. But completely open at the timing the Lord was doing. And in that moment, I needed to be ready to act. We need to be malleable and flexible in the potter's hands. I believe it's time for a new move. That new move needs courage, togetherness, faith and action. We also are living in a time of opposition and challenge, but also a great moment for the church to stand out. A time to move courageously together, full of faith and action in the power of the spirit. I know that we all want this over, but we haven't lived in a time like this before and we won't get it again. There are some things about living in the now that are important. Because if we miss what, what the Lord is doing in and through this, the Lord has nothing to do with this happening, by the way. Let's not hear any of that. But what the Lord is doing in and through this season, let's not miss that. Let's not miss the people we thought would never be open being open. Let's not miss that. Also, get ready for the first few Sundays after everything is lifted. Do you know the most important roles on those Sundays? Welcome team. Because someone will come here who's been coming to your church for a year and you never realised it. And if someone says to them, you're new, this is your first time, you might kill some of what God's been doing for months. Equally, others will just want to come. We'll just be looking for hope. How we treat people, the opportunity of, of, of churches in communities like this being beacons of hope. Let's build towards that too. But friends, like I say, we haven't lived in a day like this before, and we won't live in a day like this again. So it's time to arise for a new move of the church. When this ends, we don't know, but the opportunities for the church are right now. 
it's time for us to step up, rise up, and show what hope is when the world's got nothing to offer. Because, you know, into that, I was on Radio 4 debating with an atheist about what was going on, and an atheist and a secular humanist. And they admitted in the end, they've got, they've got nothing to offer in terms of hope in this season. That all the narratives we're told are dominating our, our culture often offer nothing in a time of life and death like the coronavirus pandemic. Hope is the name. His name is Jesus. We need to share that hope because we are the carriers of the greatest news the world could ever know. We need to make sure they hear it through our lives, through our works, through our words, and also, please God, through the odd wonder here or there. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I want to thank you for South Oxy Baptist. I want to thank you for what you're doing in this place, what you've done in this place. We thank you in this moment for Steve and Claire and for their great legacy here. And we release them as they push into new ministry now. But Lord, we want to pray for this church. We want to pray, Lord, this would be a church that makes you known. We want to pray, Lord, this is a church where there are no lonely Christians because we do go together. We want to pray, Lord, this is a church that's courageous and prepared to stand out for you, even if it looks crazy to the world. We want to pray that this is a church that is built on the faith of its forefathers, but also the faith of today to see a mighty move of you in this community and beyond. And we want to say, Lord, we're the people that are prepared to act. Even though it's hard, we want to be ready to move when you prompt us. I pray, Lord, that we would start using more arrow prayers to ask you in moments to help us instantly. I pray, Lord, that many of my friends would be encouraged by the prayer that most encourages me. Jesus, please help. But Lord, going forwards, we want to pray for this community, that this community would come to you, that this church would be thriving with people in all kinds of places. And we want to ask, Lord, that in the midst of this pandemic, where people are finding hopelessness in front of them every day, they would find from us a different story, the Jesus story. We thank you, Lord, for our brothers and sisters all over the world going through far harder things than this every day for the sake of living for you. We thank you for their example, that in the midst of the struggle, they choose joy and they choose hope. Might we do the same? And might 2021 be an amazing year for this church and beyond, we pray. Amen. What's spoken to me this morning is whether we're going to be in a position or make ourselves available, if you like, to take risks. Um, I like, I'm the sort of person that likes things just neat and tidy and, you know, within my realm, like this morning, just nearly creased me up when we couldn't get the technology to work. But I just really feel the word is that um, if God lays something on your heart to do, even though we feel we might not have the strength to do it or we're, we're not quite fully well or things are going on in our heads or whatever, if God prompts us, then, um, you know, we need to, to lead, um, to, to hear his call and, and have a go, um, particularly as we go out into the new year. So, um, yeah, let's just pray to finish this morning. Just, um, just thank you for that word um, from Gavin this morning. And, um, and many of us, you know, feel that we're maybe too old or we're not well, or, you know, what will people say? Or, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, we can't take a risk, but I just pray, Lord, that you help us as we go forward from today to hear your voice and to act, um, to, to um, you know, be brave and to be bold. Um, just take, take whatever we can do, Lord, and just multiply it, we pray. And just thank you for our time together this morning and um, just um, bless the week ahead. Amen. Amen. Amen.